Goeie avond allemaal. Uh, van harte welkom. Uh, leuk dat jullie er vanavond allemaal zijn. Uh, and a warm welcome to the Prime Minister of Moldova, Moldova Nathalie. Um, ik ga eerst even het eerste deel in het Nederlands doen en dan gaan we zo even switchen naar het Engels. Um, ik ben Kai van der Veen, uh, student van Manifel Academy. Uh, dit seminar is ook georganiseerd door Manifel Academy. Ik heb samen met mijn uh, met medestudenten uh, uh, dit georganiseerd. Um, en even een kleine uitleg van wat Manifel Academy nou eigenlijk is. Manifel Academy is een residentieel uh, onderwijsjaar voor, voor hoogbegaafde studenten. En hier geven prominenten uit, uh, uit de bedrijfstop, de culturele sector uh, en ook de publieke sector, uh, die komen hier lesgeven. Uh, en nu dus ook uh, Natalia. Um, nou, we beginnen straks even met, met, een, met een lezing, uh, waarna we een uh, Q&A gaan doen. Um, maar, dus ik ga nu, zoals ik al zei, ik ga nu even switchen naar het Engels. Uh, Natalia, uh, we are very honored to, to have you here in the, in the nice city of uh, Gouda. Um, <laughs> this, this is Natalia. <laughs> Um, you will be telling us something about uh, Moldova, um, and after that we will be doing, uh, we'll be doing uh, a Q&A. So, um, without further, further, any further ado, uh, I would like to give you the word. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be in Hauda today. Uh, and to speak to you about the situation in Moldova, but uh, also about uh, the situation in Europe and issues and challenges that are affecting, affecting people all over Europe. Uh, let me start by remembering 24th of February, 2022. Like uh, many people around Europe, we did not believe that Russia would invade Ukraine that such a brutal, unjust, and full-fledged war can happen on the European continent in the 21st century. Of course, um, we knew about the intelligence, uh, we were watching the developments in the region, we were elaborating contingency plans, but um, thought that such a blatant violation of the rules-based order uh, cannot uh, be beneficial to anyone and cannot happen. But uh, we all now know uh, that uh, uh, Russia has unleashed this uh, aggression against Ukraine. And I want to draw your attention to why this was uh, a very worrisome uh, development for Moldova, to give you a perspective just uh, what were the threats and the risks that we were facing. So Moldova shares 1,200 kilometers of border with Ukraine. One third of this border is the territory of the secessionist uh, Transnistrian region, which the central government does not control and which uh, has Russian troops on its territory. The troops officially have the mission to protect the ammunition depo depots in the village of Kobasna, located a few kilometers from the Ukrainian border, which uh, in the early 1990s uh, hosted some 20,000 tons of ammunition and is considered to pose a real danger to the region. Moldova, of course, did not have a security umbrella, having hoped for years that the principle of neutrality, which was enshrined in its constitution would convince the Russian Federation to remove its troops from our territory. So, and the military option was not a solution at all for Chisinau. The Moldovan political class uh, over 30 years has um, uh, shown dis disinterest in security and the army was underfunded, the military equipment was extremely old and the training of the military was uh, extremely precarious. We also knew that we faced a potential humanitarian crisis. So if you look at the map, the easternmost border crossing of Moldova uh, on the border with Ukraine, uh, the name is Palanka, 
uh, is only 60 kilometers away from Odessa. Uh, when I went to visit Palanka the second day after the war started, I met people who walked from Odessa to Palanka. And if you look at the distance between Odessa and our capital, Chisinau, it's under 200 kilometers. And if you look at the population, Moldova has a population of 2.6 million people and the entire Odessa region is almost as big as the entire Moldova. So 2.3 million people in the Odessa region alone. We also had a very difficult uh, economic situation, uh, not uh, only because of the war, uh, but way ahead of the war. The GDP per capita in Moldova is around uh, 5,300 US dollars in current prices for those who uh, know macroeconomics. Um, and to give you a perspective, this is about 10 times less than the GDP per capita in the Netherlands um, at the same current US prices or US dollars. Um, and we were struggling already by the beginning of the war with the consequences of the pandemic, uh, with um, uh, an energy blackmail from the Russian Federation in October of 2021, and already at that time in the fall of 2021 with increasing inflation. So uh, if we look at the political landscape in February 2022, uh, we had just started our transformation after a very difficult political period marked by capture of state institutions by oligarchic interests and pro-Russian interests. President Maya Sandu, who was at the forefront uh, of uh, the fight for this transformation, has been, had been in office for just over one year. The government that I had the honor of leading, backed by a very solid pro-European majority of the Party of Action and Solidarity, uh, which I am the first deputy president of, uh, was in power for uh, just six months. The wide support that we received in the presidential and the parliamentary elections from our people were in fact for a pro-European transformation of the Republic of Moldova. People demanded that we fight with corruption, that we uh, introduce judiciary reform and improve the rule of law, and that we um, have uh, fair competition. And even without all the challenges that I told you about, this was going to be a Sisyphean task because we all know that the most important, the most difficult reform, but which takes time, is actually a judiciary reform, a reform that builds proper um, institutions in the, in the country. And uh, of course, uh, this was only going to become much more difficult in this uh, geopolitical vortex. Um, as you can imagine, uh, especially in the first uh, days and weeks after the war in Ukraine began, we watched with great trepidation uh, the brave, very brave fight that the Ukrainians uh, have put up and how the front line uh, moved. Um, and we, of course, poured all our energy in supporting Ukraine as much as we could. We had 600,000 Ukrainian refugees that have crossed our borders. This is a country, I remind you, with a population of 2.6 million. Uh, at the highest point, we received five times more refugees than the estimated capacity uh, by UNHCR. So the UN High Commissioner for Refugees did some uh, assessments before the war and estimated that we could receive around 25,000 refugees. We had at the highest point at once in the country 125,000 refugees. And we saw such unity and solidarity and mobilization across our entire society. It wasn't just the government. It was the private sector donating. There was a lot of volunteers waiting at the border, helping with transportation, with information, with food, um, and, and supporting 
those who were fleeing the war. So with this mobilization, we actually showed the entire world that indeed Moldova was a small country, but with a big heart. And although we did not choose the context in which to serve or to lead the country, I'm very proud to say that we have not only risen to the occasion and managed overlapping multiple crises, but also we stayed true to our promises to our people and implemented structural reforms that are making Moldova ever more resilient every day. And perhaps most importantly, we received the candidate uh, country status to the European Union as the only path in our opinion to firmly anchor Moldova in the free world. But before I go into some details about how we achieved this and what are the challenges that we are still facing, let me revert to say a couple more words about Ukraine. Unfortunately, as we speak, the security, freedom, and prosperity of the people of Ukraine are being threatened continuously by this unjust war of aggression of the Russian Federation. And every day since that February 24th, 2022 that I talked about in the very beginning, uh, we are seeing innocent women and children, the young and the elderly, as well as Ukrainian soldiers on the front lines of the war, paying the ultimate price for defending us all, not only Moldova, but Europe and the European way of life, through the lives lost, through the wounds uh, suffered and the destruction endured. But what is particularly saddening in my view is that we are getting used to living um, in the neighborhood of such a terrible armed conflict in Europe. Images that are depicting new waves of attacks on Ukrainian towns and cities are relegated from breaking news to ordinary uh, events to a new tragic normal. Yet, I strongly believe that the war should never become a new normal. And we should always remember that this is uh, a terrible war that uh, and, and, and our Ukrainian uh, friends require continuously uh, our support. So I do believe that now as ever, we need to maintain and consolidate the support for Ukraine. And um, I know that Moldova will spare no effort in this regard by helping uh, those who are fleeing from the war, by facilitating the transit of goods uh, to and from Ukraine, and by cooperating to ensure uh, the safety and security on our common border. Of course, the bravery and the resilience of the Ukrainian defenders has meant that at this time, the Republic of Moldova is not under a direct military threat. Yet, uh, the firm commitment of our president, Maya Sandu, of the Party of Action and Solidarity, the ruling party, and of our government to embark on a process of profound transformation on our way towards EU membership has not been welcomed by those who would like to see my country remain in a gray zone of corruption and authoritarianism. Such forces, and here I mean first and foremost oligarchs that were disturbed by our efforts to restore the rule of law, who are acting in collusion with the Russian interest, have been waging a hybrid war against our agenda of turning Moldova into a modern European state. Disinformation and fake news, paid, illegally paid protests and provocations, cyber attacks, the misuse of energy prices in order to stoke social unrest are all part of a toolbox employed against the European aspirations of the people of the Republic of Moldova. Although we have seen elements of hybrid warfare employed in Moldova and in the region, around the world even, uh, over the years, the magnitude of the hybrid war has risen to new levels after the beginning of the war in Ukraine. And 
you know, I'll ask you to consider just a couple of uh, facts. Last year, in 2022 alone, we had approximately 300 bomb threats uh, that disrupted the functioning of key, key infrastructure and strategic institutions. In particular, this was the airport and uh, the court system. Um, you know, I can tell you that uh, uh, one day when I had to fly to Bucharest uh, for uh, a Munich Security Council reunion, uh, there was a bomb threat at the airport two hours later when the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, had to fly as well. There was another bomb threat. Um, so, uh, you know, this, the, this is just an example in one day. Um, you know, and, and this, this wasn't at all um, a coincidence considering that the airport has been in previous time illegally concessed to an oligarch uh, who participated in uh, a large banking fraud in 2014. We also saw some 200 cyber attacks and the biggest cyber attack on government uh, institutions that Moldova has ever witnessed. Um, we also see a lot of uh, fake news and information that are very difficult to regulate because they are happening on the social media, telegram canals, uh, channels, and, and, and so on. And, uh, you know, sadly, these uh, tactics uh, uh, sometimes are more successful than we would like to admit. And uh, we are seeing divisions within our society um, that are becoming very clear when we look at attitudes uh, of the people. Uh, so, you know, we remain uh, divided despite the war over some key geopolitical issues uh, ranging from the European aspirations and the relationship uh, with Russia to more recently the war in Ukraine. Uh, these divisions reflect um, different attitudes towards the Soviet past of the Republic of Moldova as well as the vulnerability, the level of vulnerability of our people in the face of fake news and disinformation promoted by uh, the Russian media. And this very clearly, you can see this very clearly along ethnicity lines, along education levels, and the age of our population. So um, I'll give you just several examples of a poll that was done last month so that you can understand Moldova a little bit better. So when asked whether the Russian Federation represents a threat to the security of the Republic of Moldova, only 42.6% of respondents said yes, and 48% said no. But then when you look at uh, the, the attitudes along ethnicity lines, for example, Romanian speakers, uh, there is a slim majority that thinks that Russia is a, th is a threat. But three quarters of r respondents who are Russian speakers do not consider Russia a threat. Um, there is also a correlation between the level of education and the perception of Russia as a threat. And this reflects the fact that people with higher levels of education are less inclined to believe in fake news. If we look, for example, if people would participate in the hypothetical uh, referendum to join the European Union, and especially when you ask people if they would prefer European Union to the uh, Eurasian uh, Union, uh, the majority, uh, as I told you, we, we had a large pro-European majority, so we have almost 60% of the people who will of course, vote for um, uh, joining the European Union. But uh, again, if we look at the preference of Russian speakers, there is um, a, a big difference. So uh, only 33.5% uh, for the EU. Um, and if you look at Romanian speakers, then you see that 70% of the popul Romanian speaking population is in favor of joining the EU. So again, you see this uh, clear divisions uh, in opinions and attitudes along ethnicity lines. Um, in another poll, uh, not this one, but 
which also looked at um, European integration, there is a very clear dividing line between different generations with the younger generations massively supporting the EU, which is good news. And interestingly, if you look at who bears the responsibility for the war in Ukraine, uh, public opinion is also very divided with 22% blaming Putin personally, 20, uh, uh, another 22% placing the blame on Russia as a state. Um, but we also have 18% who blame the USA, NATO, and 14% uh, who blame um, the Ukrainian leadership. And again, unsurprisingly, there are very, very clear lines uh, of division in these attitudes between Romanian speakers, Russian speakers, and um, it, those with high school diploma or with higher education. So th these are quite sobering um, results for politicians and the government in Moldova. Uh, and they show that we need to double our efforts to better reach people with uh, information uh, and uh, invest in education because uh, actually education is probably the best tool to fight with disinformation and develop the critical thinking that is necessary to discern um, and, and analyze the, the uh, flow of information. Um, but we also have to recognize that this is not a new uh, phenomenon. If anything, these, these numbers have improved. So for example, we saw in the recent poll support for NATO increased dramatically. It's still, uh, or for joining NATO, it is still under the majority, it's about 35%, but uh, it has almost doubled uh, from uh, uh, other polls that were conducted before the war. Um, and of course, uh, um, you know, I represent a political party um, and, and I'm very proud that uh, uh, we have managed to steer the ship through a multitude of crises, but also uh, to put in place the building blocks for much needed structural reforms. So, the, the situation that we had, you know, I talked to you about inflation, for example, or about other challenges that we faced. But many European countries face the same challenges. There's a living, cost of living crisis, uh, there is uh, the need to diversify energy in different countries at different levels. Um, there is a falling uh, economic growth, but the, again, the orders of magnitude of these problems in Moldova are much bigger. And then because of our economic situation, the capacity of the government to deal with these uh, problems are much weaker. So, um, you know, for us, for example, the energy prices increased sevenfold and we were 100% dependent on gas provision from the Russian Federation and 100% dependent on electricity provision from the separatist region also based on Russian gas. Um, and the effects of the war meant that in 2022, we lost 6% of our GDP and the average inflation was at about 30% and at its highest was even 35%. So, um, Amidst all this turbulence, uh, as I mentioned before, we uh, had to work very diligently on delivering our promises to the people in terms of improving rule of law, combating corruption, improving our institutions, ensuring that democracy works, ensuring press freedom. With all these you know, difficult trade-offs that you see in a mass media environment that is dominated by uh, Russian media, fake news and disinformation. Uh, and of course, we have been working especially diligent, diligently on the conditions that were imposed by, well, uh, that were prescribed by the European Commission uh, in order to open negotiations which dealt with de-oligarchization, combating corruption, improving uh, administrative capacity, and so on. So, just to give you some examples of, of the uh, reforms that we made, uh, we uh, 
uh, started a very ambitious external evaluation of judges' reform. So, um, with the help of uh, European retired judges, including from the Netherlands, um, we uh, vetted all applicants to the self-governing body of the judiciary, to the Superior Council of Magistrates. It took some time. Our people are anxious and impatient, but now we can firmly say we have a Superior Council of Magistrates where all members have been vetted for integrity. We also adopted legislation that enabled trial in absentia. And thus, we managed to, for example, achieve a conviction uh, of, the, of a food fugitive oligarch um, for the biggest bank fraud in the history uh, of Moldova. We also, through uh, the reforms in the judiciary, through our actions in international arbitrage, uh, regained control of the Moldovan state of the Chisinau International Airport. I told you it was illegally concessed, uh, or, or in, uh, illegally offered in concession, so we brought the airport back, which is a an, an very important security consideration as well. Uh, we also managed in just one year to diversify our gas supply from 100% dependency on Russian gas to 100% supply from alternative sources. I'm actually very proud that we were the first country, you know, I, who would have thought? We were the first country that used the new Greece-Bulgaria interconnector, and we were the first country to use the Trans-Balkan pipeline in reverse flow to provide gas from alternative sources to Moldova. Now, for a country like Moldova, this required budgetary resources, this required taking a loan from the EBRD and everything that has to do with that from negotiations to, um, you know, the, the planning of, of such a financial instrument. We, uh, is, we actually um, declared an emergency situation and ruled under an emergency decree to be able to quickly build the capacities of a state-owned enterprise to become a trader on international markets. This has never been done before. And we paid for it dearly. As I told you, the prices went up seven times for gas. But we managed also in record time to introduce a whole new social protection system where more than half of Moldovan households received subsidies from the state based on a targeted four category vulnerability uh, assessment, energy vulnerability assessment. So this had a smaller political effect than uh, it would have had uh, in the absence of such a, uh, such a program. We also, um, after three decades of neglect, started investing in our military and security capacities. We have increased the budget for our military and started accessing new tools that the European Union, for example, had, like the European Peace Facility. And this is helping us uh, fight against hybrid threats, but also, importantly, it's building our capacity now, for example, on the 1st of June to receive more than 40 heads of state in a, a summit of the European political community. Um, this would have been unthinkable just a couple of years ago. Um, and also, we have cooperated very closely with uh, the EU, the US, um, and other partners to introduce sanction mechanisms for the oligarchs that have captured the state and that have uh, defrauded the Moldovan people. And we now have uh, these oligarchs uh, on the Magnitsky Act list, and uh, recently, just last week, I think, the European Union, um, the, the Council, uh, decided that a framework for sanctioning corrupt individuals who are trying to destabilize the government should be established. And, you know, just so that, you know, it's not just me saying what we have achieved, um, 
there are a couple of indicators that, that uh, international organizations uh, compile that show this progress that Moldova made. So just uh, a couple of days ago for World Press Freedom Day, um, Reporters Without Borders ranked Moldova 28th out of 180 countries, uh, which placed us ahead of many EU countries and ahead of the US. Um, and also, if you look at uh, Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, uh, in just two years it has fallen to a 10-year low. And of course, this achievement wouldn't have been possible without the support of the European Union. I know that for countries that have been part of the European Union, sometimes it can get quite trivial, but for us, the assistance that we have received, both through bold political decisions, like the decision to grant Moldova candidate country status, through uh, financial support, like uh, uh, particularly budget support, and uh, especially budget support in the form of grants, it has really helped us uh, to achieve all these indicators that I talked about, like diversification, supporting our, uh, our people through targeted programs and so on. And then uh, at the same time, so new uh, programs for cooperation like the European Peace Facility, a civilian um, assistance mission, all of these are helping uh, to, or, or the judges, uh, for a matter of fact, that uh, participated in our external vetting system. All of this is helping um, grow Moldova ever stronger. I will uh, stop here. I will not dwell more on the uh, threats and challenges uh, that uh, are facing our region and our continent today, but um, I just in conclusion, I want to say that, you know, in 2024, we have important elections. Again, I, I'm not sure that you think about this as much as we do in Moldova, but there are elections both in the European Parliament and uh, US presidential elections. And we do think that maintaining unity within Europe and maintaining a strong transatlantic partnership is important to uh, ensure the security of our region and the security of Europe. We, we have um, extraordinary challenges, uh, you know, climate change, uh, the impact of technology and AI, um, the, the consequences of uh, this uh, uh, war on uh, geopolitical and economic relations, and um, all these difficult challenges have to be tackled um, in a way that uh, allows countries like Moldova both the uh, security and stability for that a, a small country can enjoy in a rule, rules-based world, but also um, give a perspective, a hope for our citizens for a more prosperous and uh, better future. You know, I, we do throughout the years, you know, Moldova has only been independent for 30 years. And it has gone through very difficult times through, um, you know, a change in direction and in course. But what has always been a central achievement for Moldova is that it has been able to maintain free and fair elections and democratic institutions. And even though, you know, a number of people have tried, they have not managed to impose uh, authoritarian uh, regime or to maintain the capture of state institutions. And this is what we value. This is what we consider uh, European way of life, European values. It's, it's about freedom. It's about democracy. It's about human rights. It's about fair competition. And it's about uh, a way for our citizens to uh, fulfill their potential. So um, I'm... Uh, very happy to tell you that uh, both my country, Moldova, and the current leadership, but also me personally, we're all very excited to contribute to this bright future with everybody who cherishes European values. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Very impressive um, what you said. Um, I think it's time for the Q&A session. Um, if you would like to sit on the No, the I think I'm fine. I oh, want to see stand everybody. <laughs> I'll stand. That's Maybe I'll good. stand here. Great. Sorry? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Um, wie wil hem aftrappen met de Q&A? Heeft iemand een... Kijk, daar mijn eerste vraag. Meneer, thanks for your nice lecture. Um, what is your stance on participation in NATO? Volgende even. So, um, as I mentioned during uh, my speech, uh, according to the constitution, Moldova is a neutral state. The constitution was adopted in 1994, which was two years after the war in the Transnistrian region. And enshrining the concept of neutrality in the constitution was seen as a guarantee to uh, seek in international fora um, the withdrawal of Russian troops. So we said we are neutral, we cannot have foreign troops, so please withdraw. And at the OSCE summit in 1999, uh, there was a commitment by the Russian Federation to withdraw its troops from the Transnistrian region, which was uh, never uh, respected. This commitment was never respected. But then this means that over the years there was a narrative that was built within our society that neutrality means peace, neutrality means not having troops. So um, rather than seeing uh, a security umbrella as a guarantee for peace, it was this neutrality that was seen as a guarantee for peace. So um, because of this, uh, the Moldovan population uh, views uh, integration into NATO as um, uh, you know, something that could provoke uh, our bigger neighbors. And uh, historically, support for NATO integration has been much lower than uh, integration into the European Union. Uh, I, these views are slowly changing, so as I mentioned to you in a recent poll, support for NATO integration was about 35% and it was much higher than before the war. And of course we are seeing uh, Finland and Sweden um, uh, realize that uh, a security umbrella uh, is actually uh, necessary and helpful in uh, standing up to external threats. And so I think that the views may be changes, changing, but it will take time. I think, thank you for your presentation. I think that part of the population in Moldova is still Russian minded because of its origin. And that's say 20, 30% of the population. They can take notice of the Western media and the TV, but also still the broadcasting of the Russian TV stations, I'm afraid. Because if you would block them, then they would block the freedom of press. You can't do that. Um, can you try to persuade them to also take a view at, at, at the neutral uh, broadcasting media and what have you? Is there an effort being done from the government to try to do that? So, um, we have been... Uh, introducing reforms to improve the media landscape. Uh, first, it was a de-oligarchization process. Um, so, you know, we reformed the uh, Audiovisual Council, we introduced new legislation um, on um, the media in a consultative way and so on. Um, and then, uh, when once the war started, uh, the Audiovisual Council was applying fines, uh, warnings, and so on, everything according to the law. Uh, after a year of this process, we finally closed six uh, uh, retransmitted uh, uh, channels, Russian channels. This was on the same day as, uh, uh, this decision was on the same day as the European Union decision to uh, stop the retransmission of uh, several channels uh, like the state-owned uh, uh, ORT channel, the RTR and others. Um, at the same time, um, we, you know, we, we have reformed our public institution 
but it, its uh, broadcast is largely in Romanian, uh, and uh, you know it's it's very very much independent, so it decides on its own uh, content. Uh, so it, it's a it's a difficult uh, um, a difficult area for the government to step into. At the same time, um, the the most uh, dangerous fake news and disinformation come from telegram channels or other distributed channels that are very difficult to uh, monitor and control. Further questions? Thank you for your, uh, for your speech. I thought it was very interesting. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned a few times that there's a large difference in opinion between the older generations and their view on Russia and the younger generations. And I was wondering why you think there's such a large difference between because you would think the older generations remember that the the Soviet Union era wasn't as positive, so to say. Um, I think nostalgia doesn't quite work like that. Uh, so, uh, you know, people were much younger <laughs> during the Soviet Union. So, and, and there was a lot of security, you know, I mean, there wasn't a lot of prosperity, but uh, uh, at the same time, sort of, there was this uh, sense of uh, security. Um, and so I think that um, the older generation, particularly Russian speakers, you know, who uh, had benefits during the times of the Soviet Union, they are very nostalgic uh, about that period. Um, I think uh, sort of this uh, uh, generation, uh, like 45 to 60 year old, I think they remember the fall of the Soviet Union and the transition uh, that was uh, very difficult and, and uh, uh, they are less likely to support. But it depends on where they are. So there's a rural, rural urban divide. There is an educational divide. So uh, also speaking to the earlier question on Russian speakers, actually there are uh, quite a few Russian speakers that support the pro-European path. Um, it's just that the, the, div the, the dividing lines fall in different proportions uh, based on ethnicity. And then all of these um, variables have to be analyzed together because, uh, you know, Russian speakers with higher uh, deg deg uh, education are more likely to support a pro-European path. So uh, again, I think that um, it's important to reform institutions to improve good governance and at the same time, despite all the difficulties, not forget to invest in education uh, because th probably this is the only um, realistic way for us to educate our societies in terms of discerning uh, fake news from real information. Thank you. Thanks for your lecture. Uh, do you think Transnistria forms a threat in securing the growth of Moldova? Um, you know, definitely it has an impact. Um, with a separatist region, particularly before the war when there was an open border, uncontrolled border, um, this was, uh, uh, of course, a, a big factor. But uh, I want to say that things are changing. Um, what we have now, after the war began, is a closed border. So, for example, when the Russian troops rotate, they have to come through the Chisinau airport and we no longer accept them. Um, the goods and services that are exported by the Transnistrian region, the majority of which, by the way, are exported to the EU after the signing of the Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement with the EU, it has to go through um, our borders. So this is changing a little bit the dynamic. Um, of course, the, you know, we still have the troops on the territory. We still have years and years of disinformation and propaganda. Uh, so th there's a long way towards uh, democratization, but depending on how the war, when and how the war in Ukraine ends, there may be uh, a real possibility for a solution, unlike with other uh, frozen conflicts in the Soviet Union, in the former Soviet Union. 
Ik zag hier een vinger, ja. Well, thank you very much for uh, everything you told us. My name is Peter Nortuk. In the past, I've done quite a lot of training for political talents in Central and Eastern Europe, including people from Moldavia. And uh, every time I, I noticed they really wanted to be part of Europe, wanted to be democratic, and they went along and they worked hard, but at some point they made a choice to go west and not stay mm -hmm. in their own country. The talents often are leaving yeah. the country. Could this be a moment that for you, 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 know, you can unite in such a way that the young talents will stay in your country with the right kind of challenge for them? This is a very good question and actually an area that I haven't addressed in my lecture. Uh, we have uh, extraordinary out-migration. There, there are estimations that uh, up to one million Moldovans are living and working abroad. Um, by, the way, by the way, there are a lot of Moldovans who hold double Romanian and Moldovan citizenship and actually, uh, you know, in terms of its population, uh, Moldova uh, is uh, halfway integrated with a lot of EU and NATO citizens um, on its territory. Um, you know, I have also done this and gone west. Uh, I have always come back. Uh, so, you know, I would spend three, four years in the west and then go back, work for the public service, you know, um, learn about a banking fraud or something, go back again. Then, so. Uh, I, I believe in circular migration, um, and I do believe that this uh, prospect of joining the European Union can really become a uh, 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 sort of uh, beacon of hope for young people. Can, so I, for ex yeah. can I add something to that then? Uh, there's an analyst called Krastev, and he says, the Bulgarian uh, guy, very good, and he says, well, I, I'm worried if this whole situation takes too long, there are already many countries in East and Central Europe for years and years now in the waiting room. Unless we all take them to the emergency room, mm. they could go back and align with Russia again. Do you see this risk? I mean, I understand the trade-offs because um, we actually are doing uh, the pro-European reforms for our citizens first and foremost. And we do not want shortcuts. We really want for these reforms and transformations to have real impact on a citizen's life in the country. You know, and, and just, the ch just getting Moldova sort of a status doesn't get us there. And in my view, that's the most important thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes the process I mean, we, I do believe we have to be in negotiations. I do believe we have to look at each chapter and, you know, grow more and more detailed and granular on the type of reforms that we can implement, the type of assistance we can receive, the type of training, people, capacity building that we can mobilize. But at the same time, you know, I, shortcuts will not necessarily achieve what, what we set out to achieve, and that is real transformation for our people. So I do believe we need to move fast. At the same time, I do believe in a meritocratic process where if the country achieves the transformation, then it can move faster. Thank you so much for your very interesting uh, lecture. I'm so excited. I will be the new deputy ambassador from July on in Moldova. Oh, great. In our new uh, embassy. Thank you so much. So I was really excited to come here tonight. And yeah, I would like to hear from you. How do you see the cooperation between the Netherlands and uh, Moldova? And how, yeah, what can we do in your opinion to extend our relations? So um, I'm very glad that uh, the Netherlands uh, just opened an embassy uh, in Moldova. We had the visit of the uh, foreign minister uh, and this shows uh, the growing cooperation between our countries. We're very happy that uh, we got an unanimous decision to, for Moldova to become a candidate country. Uh, this is very important. First and foremost, we need bold political decisions um, and, and you know, then the, the, the details. So um, I think that uh, sort of this uh, 
uh, rapprochement is uh, very welcomed. And of course, um, uh, you know, we need to deepen our cooperation, you know, be it on our programs on capacity building or um, trade. Um, you know, we are working very hard to get investment into Moldova. Uh, this unfortunately has been thwarted by um, the war in Ukraine, but I think that we need to find new tools, new instruments to deepen our uh, economic cooperation and to uh, make sure we bring strategic investment uh, into Moldova. So bold political decisions, um, not only aid, but trade <laughs> and investment, um, and uh, of course, sharing your capacities, your experience, uh, you know, like uh, these uh, uh, experts or judges that are helping in justice reform or uh, other experts that are participating in different sectors. Thank you, looking forward. Thank you very much for your most interesting lecture. Um, I have a question on this um, integration. Uh, the, and, and, and I, I think um, the Moldovan government has recently reported, maybe already twice, to the European Commission what it has been done uh, mm -hmm. on the path of reform. Um, what do you expect for, from, from the Commission later this year? I mean, how much of this homework has already been done? What is the perspective for the, the, the remaining part? And, and what kind of, a, of, of assistance does Moldova need to get to the finishing line? Thank you. So, um, you know, M Moldova received the recommendations of the Commission, which talked, as I said, about de-oligarchization, justice reform, combating corruption, uh, increasing administrative capability. And then Moldova came up with this self-imposed uh, action plan where it you know, uh, listed a number of decisions that it will take, laws that it will adopt, uh, actions that it would do to uh, get us closer to the implementation of the recommendations. And um, the, the latest report which we have submitted shows that we are sort of most of the way there. I think uh, this, the figure was at 70 percent. Um, of 75 percent um, of, of the recommendations, but it's not about ticking the boxes. It's about you know what has happened in reality on the ground, and as I said, um, the fact that we were able to return the airport to state ownership and state administration is very important in our de-oligarchization, in fight for de-oligarchization. So it's not just about adopting a law where we say, oh, you can't hold. Uh, you know, shares in so many media channels and so on, because often these can be circumvented. It's about, you know, what we are able to achieve in reality on the ground. So uh, we do have um, achievements beyond the self-imposed action plan because uh, this is in our DNA, in our political DNA, because uh, our initial objective was to reduce corruption and to uh, improve governance. So, um, again, I, I told you about the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. We have a change in management of a lot of state-owned enterprises. We have uh, more transparent financing reporting of these state-owned enterprises. In a very difficult year, we had an increase in dividends from these uh, uh, enterprises. So. Everything that we do is towards these recommendations. We are the only country that has a governance-focused program with the International Monetary Fund. So uh, despite all the macroeconomic challenges that we've had over the last two years, we actually maintained and delivered on this program, including through the judiciary reform, vetting of uh, magistrates, uh, the reforms that we are doing to the anti-corruption prosecutors, to the uh, procedures on criminal investigations, criminal procedure. So uh, we, we have adopted a new electoral code in line with Venice Commission recommendations which will be adopted from this autumn. So there's, there are sort of tens and hundreds of decisions that we have taken to, to get us there. So what we expect in the autumn is a bold decision to start negotiations.
Thank you so much for your lecture. I was wondering, um, considering the fact that both Moldova and the Ukraine are striving for EU status, Moldova now, of course, reaching candidate status, what has the exchange of knowledge been like amongst the two states? So uh, we actually have an agreement to cooperate, including on uh, our process for European integration, and there are regular meetings uh, to discuss uh, progress and to exchange uh, ideas and views. Uh, we have a very uh, close cooperation uh, with Ukraine on border security, on uh, security more broadly, uh, on humanitarian assistance, on uh, support to the refugees, on support to culture, for example. We've announced this year as the year of Ukrainian culture in Moldova. A theater has moved to, um, to Moldova. We had, you know, the Mariupol theater uh, come to Moldova. So, so we, are, we have a, a new agreement on collaborating in education. Uh, to bring students, teachers to Moldova. So we have wide-ranging cooperation on all issues, including on um, our process for European integration. At the same time, um, we are in a um, better position due to uh, the bravery of the Ukrainian uh, defendants, and we are very grateful to them, because this means that um, you know, Moldova is not under direct military threat. So I think on some issues, because of that, we are able to move uh, perhaps uh, quicker or um, you know catch up. Because in, in, on some in some areas we are in a different position uh, in relation to the adjustment to Aki communitaire. On some issues uh, we are more advanced, and on some issues Ukraine is more advanced. Yeah, thanks a lot for your lecture. Uh, you briefly touched upon the EU Moldovan DCFTA uh, mm -hmm. and also the implications for the successionist entity of Transnistria. Uh, and I was just wondering about like the further implications uh, for the relationship between Moldova and Transnistria. Uh, like, has it had some kind of confidence building effect or has it caused more tension? Because I believe uh, Moldova can judge what kind of products um, Transnistria can export to the European market. Uh, so it, has there been more tension or is it more state-level trust between both parties? Um, I'm, I'm not sure how I would uh, estimate the confidence-building effect. <laughs> but, um, uh, so I believe that the DSCFTA helped to reorient our trade towards EU markets. It has helped our... Um, companies, both on the right bank and on the left bank, to uh, introduce new ways, new technologies, new processes to be able to export to the European markets. And uh, this is helping politically because it means that we have more people who want closer integration with the EU and not with the Eastern markets. Now, the situation changed even more um, during the, um, or since the beginning of the war. Uh, so I told you that previously we had a border that we didn't control. We didn't know how many goods and services were flowing through that border, um, officially or uh, you know, through contraband. Now that border is closed, this is changing um, our uh, ability to see the trade and to, um, uh, to understand sort of the, the, the flows of goods, services, and financial flows. So this is helping us in our analysis on the future uh, of activities we don't talk about too much in the public for, uh, I think, clear reasons. Uh, but uh, we are getting ready to uh, be able to use any historical windows of opportunities for uh, set settlement that may arise. Now, um, the Transnistrian region's economy is quite different from the uh, right bank because historically during the Soviet Union it was more industrialized. Um, so, uh, you know, on one hand, for example, we are dependent on the cheap electricity produced by the Transnistrian region, but on the other hand, you know, we 
have now more tools to, uh, for example, um, introduce fiscal monopolies or other instruments to be able to control the flow of certain goods uh, towards the EU. Um, and I want to say here that the decision to, of the European Union last year to increase the quota for um, uh, freely traded Moldovan agricultural goods in particular um, has been very welcomed. Uh, we are not fully using the quota on all of the products. We are not really sort of a threatening competitor, uh, but uh, this is a very important signal for our uh, producers to invest. Uh, and and uh, as you can understand, during these times of a lot of insecurity, uh, uh, difficulty to forecast what will happen, this actually provides some positive outlook that helps these micro decisions uh, to invest in, in growing uh, uh, production and growing capacity. We're also very grateful for the um, um, decision to give us uh, transportation authorizations. Uh, this has been very important. So the most affected product, for example, from the uh, loss of the Eastern market is uh, apples. And um, actually we have been able to help our producers reorient their trade and start exporting towards EU countries. This means that they have to improve their standards. We have specific programs, financing instruments to help them diversify. But uh, we saw the, the um, uh, quantity of apples uh, exported to Romania increase dramatically. And this has been very helpful. You know, I, um, I remember my very difficult meeting with agricultural producers in the north of Moldova, which is traditionally more sort of pro-Russian. And it was a very, you know, intense meeting. And then uh, I remember a couple of months back when one of the producers said, you know, uh, we met with the Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the producer stood up and said, thank you for this and this and this and this and this. We never knew that in one year we could just, uh, you know, diversify uh, our markets. And um, uh, I, I give this example often in Moldova and I want to give it to you. Uh, we have a very uh, nice wine industry. Um, you know, we, last year we took uh, the biggest number of medals in the international wine competitions and a Moldovan wine uh, was recognized as the best red wine uh, in uh, the world in the, at the Brussels uh, exhibition. And we also have very nice wineries to visit, which are now tourist uh, facilities. How did this happen? Because we had embargoes introduced by the Russian Federation over the years. So the first embargo was in 2006, um, you know, when Moldova decided that it wants to go on the pro-European path. That was the first embargo on Moldovan wines. Uh, and then we had another one in 2013. And what, what these embargoes meant for our producers is that they had to find other markets. They had to reorient to the EU. This means that they had to adopt different quality standards different marketing um, approaches, uh, you know, and this has led to the development of creative industry, uh, you know, packaging industries, exporting industry services, and so on. And what we saw is that with support from our, our friends, because we had uh, assistance projects uh, that, that came after the embargo, we actually managed to really develop a, 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 a industry that we can be proud of. So I'm hoping very much that uh, this can be achieved for our apples or for other products um, that, that, that we want to, um, uh, you know, where we want to grow the market and, and export. So I do believe that these free trade agreements, the decisions to remove quota or to help with the transportation really helps to sort of anchor the country, as I said, in the pro-European path. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much. Um, 
I was wondering, you mentioned that a lot of Moldovans have a double nationality, mostly mm -hmm. with uh, the Romanian uh, passport as well. Um, I was wondering, on the other side, whether maybe a lot of them have a Russian passport, what the effect would be on uh, geopolitical geopolit moves uh, on Moldovan elections in the future if on, uh, with double nationality? Mm. So, um, uh, just as an anecdote, I actually know somebody with five passports in Moldova. Um, you know, Moldovans had to find a way, uh, the hard way. Uh, we have always been sort of in the periphery of different uh, uh, empires. So, and, and then, you know, we had quite a bit of political volatility early in our independence. So, we had this massive uh, migration um, drive and then the, the um, uh, you know, migrants were able to uh, obtain the citizenship of the countries where they were staying. And then also those who did not, uh, or, or whose grandparents lived in Romania, and this is most of the population in Moldova, and were illegally deprived of the Romanian citizenship, were able to uh, get it back. We uh, have numbers for, uh, or approximate numbers for those who hold Romanian citizenship, and it's now more than a million. Uh, but we do not have numbers for those who hold other types of citizenship. What we do know is that in elections, the Moldovan diaspora is very active. Uh, it, the proportion of Moldovans abroad who vote is about 15% of the vote, which is the highest of any country in the world that allows uh, participation of diaspora. The participation is mostly in European countries, and 80% of the diaspora vote is pro-European. Thank you for your presentation. Um, what I find very interesting um, when I look at the geographic map of Moldova is that you are very near to the Black Sea, mm -hmm. but it's, the Black Sea is actually on the border of Ukraine. Um, and you are now near the port of Rotterdam, and we know how important uh, a free port is for the economic development of a country. How do you deal with the fact that uh, you are just meters away from, uh, from, uh, from the Black Sea. Um, and um, so that's, that's my question. How do you deal with that? And do you have other mechanisms just to have the economic development grow and flourish? So we have a, a small port of uh, 500 meters on the Danube, uh, which allows for a small number of ships uh, with, you know, that are able to uh, go, uh, you know, not in not very deep waters, like river flow, river port. Uh, so, so we do have uh, this Djurdjulesht uh, port that's very small, but it is uh, a port that is helping with trade. But at the same time, we are very much focused on con our connectivity uh, through other means. So we are now investing in our railroads. Uh, there is, uh, you know, support from... Uh, for example, the French Development Agency in helping us do feasibility studies to understand uh, investments in the railroad. And uh, we are rebuilding and building new bridges with Romania for the first time since independence. The, what separates us from Romania uh, is, again, a river. Uh, we have, um, I think, seven functioning uh, 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 board, uh, uh, bridges on, on the river, and before the Second World War, there were 21. So uh, there is a lot of uh, potential for growth there. So uh, we need to invest in other types of uh, cargo and transportation um, because of this geographical position. But uh, yeah, we also uh, uh, are working on sort of strategic development of uh, the Djurdjulesh port. But at the same time, as many strategic assets in Moldova, it's marred in um, private um, lawsuits. So we have to see what these lawsuits lead to. I also have a small question. I read in, um, on Wikipedia, whatever, that in the thousands of uh, 
Moldavia, there's also a Turkmenistan region that's independent. Is that true or is it totally, is that com to compared to the Transnistria, is it the, the same situation or? So we do have uh, in the south of Moldova an autonomous region called Gagauzia, uh, which is inhabited by uh, Christianized Turks um, that uh, have remained from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, though the population in the autonomous region is uh, more Russophile, and we do have elections for the governor uh, underway um, uh, as, as, as we speak, in the, there will be a second uh, round uh, in the next couple of days. And uh, we, it, it's an autonomous region, it's not separatist uh, like Transnistria, there are no foreign troops on the territory, but it's uh, very heavily influenced by uh, propaganda uh, and uh, uh, sort of meddling in elections, illegal financing. So. Uh, there is a special parliamentary commission to work uh, with the uh, um, representatives of the autonomous region, but also we are undertaking um, uh, sort of renewed efforts to improve governance in that region as well. So it's a complicated, it's small, but very heterogeneous and complicated country. <laughs> um, if there are no more que ah, another question. Yeah. Yes, thank you for your inspiring words. You're very enthusiastic, so inspiring. Uh, I was just wondering, and um, and deep respect also for the people of Moldavo that adapt all those refugees from the Ukraine. But what is the impact of those refugees on the unemployment rate or the economic circumstances for your country? Uh, thank you. So uh, we actually um, very quickly adopted uh, legislation that um, allowed Ukrainian refugees to work, uh, but also allowed them access to services, uh, health, education services. We are the only non-EU country that has extended the temporary protection mechanism to Ukrainian refugees. Um, this, of course, uh, uh, has an impact um, in terms of accessing public services, but we are receiving support uh, to implement this temporary protection mechanism from uh, UNHCR and other uh, organizations and are redirecting some of the budgetary resources towards uh, supporting this, uh, these uh, refugees. Um, we are facing a deficit of labor force so actually, we very much encourage the Ukrainians to participate in our labor force, and we do consider this as a contribution uh, to uh, the economic development. So, uh, for example, I have uh, uh, seen uh, a company in the automa automotive industry that has relocated a project from Ukraine to its Moldovan plant uh, and uh, employed Ukrainian refugees. I think this, uh, these are very good examples. And I think this is a real way to support the refugees, support Ukraine, um, and support Moldova. So, um, you know, uh, our population has been uh, very um, strong in its support for uh, Ukrainian refugees. And even if we incur costs, we do understand that uh, uh, our security is also due to their sacrifice. So. Uh, we are willing to uh, support them. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah. I, I see another question. <laughs> I'm very impressed that the Moldovan boot camp is uh, receiving so much interest. <laughs> yeah, thanks again. Uh, I was just wondering if you could uh, lastly like relate on the media landscape in, in Moldova and then please relate to it with regard to like the media ownership uh, and the like Romanian and Russian language sources there are. Um, right, so we, um, we had a m media landscape that was very much um, owned and captured by oligarchic interests with a uh, diminishing of financial flows and with sanctions introduced against these oligarchs, their influence has uh, reduced. 
uh, and uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, we have taken steps against the uh, Russian retransmitted channels. We have adopted legislation on um, locally produced content. We have also um, uh, adopted rules on uh, media advertising for uh, like de demonopolizing media advertising. Um, so right now we have a public television station um, which uh, has new leadership, is being invested in and is very much independent from the government. We have a number of independent media channels that are financed privately, uh, including with support from international media organizations that promote sort of uh, uh, free journalism. And then we have uh, still uh, media channels that are retransmitted or that um, particularly entertainment um, uh, and uh, that are owned by um, sort of private interest groups. Unfortunately, a lot of the entertainment is still in Russian. Uh, so uh, there is more to do there to encourage uh, Romanian language uh, uh, production and content. Um, at the same time, as I mentioned, uh, the social media landscape is very important. These telegram channels, um, you know, TikTok, uh, so these new avenues um, play a very important role in the creation of uh, perceptions and attitudes. So um, it's not just about the traditional media landscape, it's also about the, the uh, social media and online resources. Um, this is a, a difficult uh, sector, not only for Moldova, but for many d mature democracies. This is why I believe very strongly that um, education is the key to uh, maintaining a healthy informational landscape for our citizens. Okay, thank you so much. Um, if I can end the Q&A with uh, one last question of myself. Um, you said that uh, Moldova is uh, dealing with uh, a massive uh, inflation issue, uh, average of 30% and at the highest point 35 how will the entry of Moldova into the European affect the currency of the uh, euro? Do you have any idea what's, what effect it would have on the currency? So, first of all, it's a long-term process. Second of all, um, you know, probably euro integration is a much longer way away than joining the European Union. So, um, we would have to be ready to join the euro. So. I don't see any particularly big effect on um, um, on, on the euro. But uh, uh, yes, infl inflation is a big issue. What I think is interesting about inflation uh, for uh, all economists in the room is that uh, it's very much linked to uh, the conflict. So it doesn't follow the traditional sort of economic rules. So we have Euro countries that have high inflation, we have non-Euro countries that have low inflation, and it seems that the correlation is more with the uh, <coughs> proximity to the war, the need to diversify energy resources, the impact of logistic crisis and other crises on the uh, on the country or on the specific region. So um, it's it's more to do inflation is more to do with the conflict now than with the Euro membership. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the Mandeville Academy for inviting me for the interest in uh, the geopolitical development in my region and to everybody who came to Hauda to uh, listen about uh, the situation in Moldova. Uh, and um, I'm very excited that uh, we managed to maintain such high interest uh, for such a long time. And thank you for your questions. <laughs>
Zo, en dan sluiten we de avond ook uh, alweer af. Uh, ik wil jullie graag nog uitnodigen voor een drankje uh, op Westhaven nummer 62. Uh, er zullen wat studenten zijn waarin we met groepjes uh, die kant op lopen, zodat het niet verdwaald raakt. En mocht u dus wel verdwaald raken, Westhaven 62, dan, vind, dan kunt u het vinden. Um, ik wil jullie allemaal enorm bedanken, mensen van het geluid, van het beeld. Ook ontzettend bedankt en natuurlijk uh, de staf van Mendeville. Um, maar het meeste wil ik bedanken. Thank you so much, Natalia, for, the, for this wonderful evening. And also for the lecture you had uh, this uh, afternoon at Mendeville Academy. Um, thank you so much. Thank you.